Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this very special online event. Um, myself and the panelists have just been discussing what it's like getting 400 people into a Zoom webinar. 400 is an amazing number. So we're just going to give it a few seconds for people to join the call before we start properly. Um, but like I say, we're absolutely thrilled with the number of people that have joined this evening. I've not, not just done a webinar myself before, so it's quite fun seeing all the numbers slowly creep up on all the participants. But what I shall do is I shall start some introductions gradually. So welcome everyone to this um, special online event in collaboration um, with Birmingham Royal Ballet and Sadler's Wells Theatre. My name is uh, Jonathan Payne and I'm a principal character artist and assistant repetitor for Birmingham Royal Ballet. My job tonight is really just to introduce the event and to introduce the panellists. Um, I might contribute later on, who knows. Um, but really this event is about our uh, triple build that Birmingham Royal Ballet are starting performing next week called Into the Music. And I'm going to throw some dates at you. So we are at the Hippodrome Theatre in Birmingham on Friday the 21st and Saturday the 22nd of October, that is next week. And then we are bringing the programme to Sadler's Wells Theatre in London from Wednesday the 2nd to Saturday the 5th of November. Um, the programme is going to be fantastic and the company working incredibly hard on it at the moment. We have two company premieres and one world premiere. We open with Forgotten Land, the iconic uh, piece by Yuri Killian and that is a company premiere. We then have a world premiere, Hotel, by Morgan Runica Temple, um, and a, a totally new piece, obviously. Um, and then we finish with a company premiere, Seventh Symphony, uh, by Uwe Schultz to the Beethoven score. I should have said also Forgotten Land is to the Benjamin Britten Sinfoni de Requiem. Uh, we want to sell, obviously, as many tickets as we can, so please keep an eye on all our social media channels about various offers or, or um, uh, screenings, etc. And we might do Facebook Lives, etc. And for the first time, we we're offering discounted tickets for full-time students for Into the Music and our production of Capalia. So keep a lookout for those too. Just before we start, a couple of little housekeeping things. So you don't have to spend the hour looking at just our faces on a screen. I'm going to be occasionally screen sharing with you some images if they are appropriate to what we are discussing. Um, and if I do screen share, just bear with me that awkward two or three seconds when your screen changes and you see my desktop before the image comes up. But I hope that it just might sort of illustrate whatever we are talking about. And secondly, we are going to invite you to ask your questions. Um, we're going to have 15 or 20 minutes at the end for you to ask our panellists anything you'd like to. You can put your questions into the chat box on Zoom and I shall be looking at those during the event. And towards the end, we'll um, get to some of those questions. So do just keep throwing them in there. That's absolutely fine. So I've got a great um, privilege to introduce our panel. They've got a superb one this evening. Um, we were going to have Sir Alistair Spaulding with us from Sadler's Wells Theatre hosting the event. He cannot make it, but we are incredibly fortunate to have Ismini Brown chairing tonight. Ismini is an arts journalist. I'm sure you all know her very well. She was dance critic for over 20 years of The Spectator and Daily Telegraph and founded the website The Arts Desk. So Ismini, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Great pleasure. We have the director of Birmingham Royal Ballet and obviously probably one of the greatest male dancers of our generation, Carlos Acostas. Thank you for joining us, Carlos. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And we also have Celine Gittens. Celine is a principal with Birmingham Royal Ballet, has spent all her career with the company. She has danced all the principal roles, um, classical, modern and contemporary. And Celine is in Forgotten Land and Seventh Symphony. You've had a long day, um, Celine. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and lastly, we are very um, pleased to have Cora Boss Cruzi with us. Cora has had a superb long career um, on, in Europe and for 17 years worked absolutely like this 
with Yui Killian. And Cora is staging um, Forgotten Land for us. And I have the, well, the, just the immense privilege to be in the studios assisting and listening to everything she says. She embodies the spirit and choreography of, of Yuri Killian. So, um, Cora, you've had also a very long day, so thank you very much for joining us. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and share all this, that people do come and see this programme, because I think the dancers have worked incredibly hard to get it there where it need, needs to be in a very short time. And uh, their hearts are in it. So mm -hmm. I think it's important that we let people know to come and watch this and share other people to join them as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you haven't got your tickets, you will be inspired to after this hour, I am sure. So that, so that, <laughs> enough from me for the world. Anyway, I'm going to pass over to Ismini Brown to um, start us off. Ismini. Hello, everybody. A great pleasure for us to have this um, conversation. Um, we are partly, well, quite a lot of this webinar is about Yuri Kilian, who is 75 this year. And uh, he's perhaps the most celebrated of the generation of major European ballet choreographers who emerged in the ballet boom of the 70s. And the popularity and renown of Netherlands dance theatre, of course, over the past quarter century is down to him. But he's also part of a very dynamic and large story of the boom in European ballet that emerged from protégés of John Cranko, the Royal Ballet choreographer who left for Germany in 1960 and who soon after joined by Kenneth Macmillan for several years. And other Cranko alumni, such as John Neumer and William Forsyth, are of course household names. And in the 70s, Germany and Holland became powerhouses of um, ballet companies like Stuttgart Ballet, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Berlin, and of course, NDT. Uwe Scholz, who we know another choreographer on this bill, was also a Cranko school dance student, one of the last um, before Cranko's untimely death, and he became director of Leipzig Ballet. So this bill is really reconnecting the boom in Germany and Holland with its original bloodline in Britain, and the British relatives, in a way, are rediscovering the extended family uh, that they didn't really know about. We've seen many of Killian's ballets on numerous visits by the three NDT companies on British tours, and actually some ballets have been performed by British companies over the past 30, 40 years, Symphony of Psalms and Petit Mont at Rombert, uh, Petit Mont more recently at English National Ballet, and Return to the Strange Land and Sinfonietta at the Royal Ballet. And the Royal Ballet School and ENB School have performed Killian's dances in graduation showcases. But this is a big landmark in Killian's um, work that we're about to see, and Carlos, the first for Birmingham Royal Ballet. That's right. That's right. When I first joined the company as the director, uh, I realized that uh, the Birmingham Royal Ballet never performed a Killian before, and I, I set my, you know, a goal to change that. Uh, and then also, I, I was trying to bring everything new, uh, new choreographers, to even to introduce new choreography to the UK. I realized that Uber shows work never been uh, seen in the UK or with that frequency. Uh, I remember when I was a guest in the Stuttgart Ballet um, in the early 2000, uh, I, I, I went there to perform Don Quixote and while I was there, I get exposed. You know, I had a chance to watch a Seventh Symphony and I thought that is a ballet that it trained and developed a company because it's a large cast they're doing extremely hard uh, steps all the way across the, the, the company. And uh, it just it helped to develop the company. Uh, and so I thought that uh, it would be a great asset as well for the Birmingham Royal Ballet. But Killian, I have a great, great fun and admire it to Killian. And sadly, uh, one of my regrets of my career is that I never got to perform it. While I was in Houston Ballet, I saw Sinfonieta uh, for the first time and I I, need, I didn't make the casting there. And then while I was in the Royal Ballet, Sinfonieta came into the repertory, but I was busy doing Spartacus or all the things around the world. And then I got, I hadn't got the chance to perform it. But uh, I think it's just wonderful that these dancers at BRB had that exposure and they're learning a great deal. It is tiring. This bill, it's, it's a tour de force in many ways. 
But uh, you know, for those who are see uh, we, that we are on on the other side, and we actually see how the company is developing and the dances are developing, is something beautiful. So, for all of you who haven't uh, seen the company just now, uh, I would recommend that this is a, a, a strong build that you could come and witness, so that you could see Celine looking incredible, and uh, and the rest of the of the dancers at VIP. So yes. Obviously, with Cranko's own background, we can see there's a strong Royal Ballet School connection emerging because Killian did a last year of his training at the Royal Ballet School when he was 20 and his classmates included uh, Marion Tate and Stephen Jeffries. So there's a BRB connection there. And his first job with Cranko in Stuttgart, he said he adored Cranko. He said Cranko gave people chances and he had a tremendous ability to build people. Um, so I was going to ask Cora, um, you were one of Killian's most important dancers and muse figures at NDT, but you also trained at the Royal Ballet School. I did, um, yes. That, was that where you discovered Killian or not? No, no, no. I discovered Killian when I came back to Holland after my Royal Ballet training. I went to the Conservatorium in The Hague because I am Dutch and my family was back in Holland, so we all joined forces again there. Uh, and then uh, from the conservatorium, there were the auditions. I didn't think I was going to be a contemporary dancer. I wanted to do the classics. Uh, so I was auditioning for Dutch National, hoping to get in. I didn't get that. I got a contract with Ballet of Flanders. And so I was celebrating. And then I got this offer to go to the audition for NDT with like 500 people, like it was a huge audition. So I just went along to see my friends, not thinking I was a contemporary dancer and could do that. And then I got the job and they didn't, it was terrible. <laughs> but in the end, that was the biggest, uh, yeah, that was an amazing switch for me. And uh, it opened up a whole new world, like, uh, but I watched the pieces uh, that they performed and just felt always it was out of reach, actually. Yeah, it was, uh... 30, you spent 13 years there with him and you in, yeah. uh, originated many of his big works. I mean, what made you find your artistic home there as a Royal Ballet School trained person? Yeah, that's why I think because I was in The Hague for the Conservatorium and then I got the job to go to NDT2 first. And then my director of uh, conservatorium, she just told me, you know, this is a ticket to the world. You must take this as a job. You know, you'll learn so much. And I did it. And that's uh, and I was in the right place at the right time, got the chance to work so closely with him. And he was very inspiring for us. And uh, yeah, we grew from there. Yeah. And how do you remember the original creating of Forgotten Land? I was not in the creation of Forgotten Land. Oh, sorry, but you were one of the early. It was created on Stuttgart Ballet. Okay. So, like the big stars like Birgit Kyle and Marcia Heide were actually in the original cast. And then it came back to uh, NDT after they had premiered it. Then the piece was danced by the dancers of NDT. And then it evolved from there as well. It got much more movement in it than it did at the first prime, uh, yeah, the premiere with the with the other company. Yeah. Yeah. So but that's many years ago, that's in 81. Yeah, so that's uh, before my time. <laughs> I, I, I put the wrong number down. Um, but anyway, it's an inspired by a combination of Britain's music, Britain's environment and a monk painting. Um, exactly. So the Symphonia de Requiem has three parts mirrored by the portraying of three stages in a woman's life. Um, the idea, it's drawn from the Munch painting, 1899, The Dance of Life, which you can see here. Um, and Killiam said that he also thought of the North Sea lapping on the East Anglian coast where Britain lived. And the sea is something that both gave and took life. So it's it's a rich mix of themes, isn't it? And it was designed at the time by John McFarlane, who we know as Birmingham Royal Ballet's great designer of fantasies like Nutcracker and Cinderella, but who actually began his career at NDT and designed eight of Killian's ballets and many yeah. others. Yeah. Yeah, he's a wonderful designer. I mean, the costumes and the sets and everything is just phenomenal. It's this huge wave that goes to the backdrop and the backdrop has sort of a painting on it 
which then with the light changes in atmosphere during the piece. So it's beautiful how um, the moods of the music then gets reflected in that backdrop with the dance in the front, of course. But uh, the whole thing about the wave uh, being inspired for Yuri of giving and taking life and you know the passages that we all go through in life uh, like we are people and then using dancers to show people in their different stages and relationships in life uh, is is a, of course a fantastic rich thematic uh. Well, we'll talk to Selene in a minute about what it's like to dance some of the, the leading parts in this, but, but Carlos, why was it this particular ballet you decided to do of the Killian oeuvre for the first one for, for Birmingham? I think it was, uh, I, it's one of the Gillian's classics, what he calls the classics. I think it would be, a, uh, I thought that would be a good introduction to the company. Obviously, I'm very fond of Bella Figura. That's that's initially the ballet that I, I I wanted, and I still will will hopefully you know in the future we could bring it to a repertory, and Sinfonietta as well. I love Sinfonietta, uh, but um, I thought that it was a good introduction to the company, um, uh, and I think uh, the cast is is uh, it was is quite manageable for our size of the company and also well, at the same time give the opportunity to a second cast and so it was just perfect what let's talk about what it's like to change from classical to Killian style because Cora you were just saying when that you auditioned and you joined the company you did feel that it was a distinct switch of of, of style and feeling to it um what, what one sees is actually I would say it, it's what you might call a new ballet it's a ballet it's not contemporary dance in the sense that it clearly uses ballet vocabulary and it's it's very fluid it's very lyrical and and deeply grounded um, and personally, I've seen echoes of folk dance in it, for instance, almost the uh, physical and emotional engagements of social dancing as well. Um, and the storytelling is less psychological and narrative, perhaps, than in the English school of Ashton and Macmillan, um, more like abstracts of feelings, of, of sort of abstracts of universal feelings. So, Cora, is, is that one of the differences that you felt about switching over from classical to Killian? I think the classical is a very deep base also for Yuri, like uh, like having a nice line and and uh, beautiful bodies to work and sculpt with was very much a starting point for him. We always did a ballet class to start the day. You know, it's not like we did contemporary class to do a, a piece of Killian. So, but of course he he deviated from that to use more breath in the movement and not so. Um, as positioned, it is about the motion. I think Forgotten Land is a lot about the motion that drives you, the driving force of how you uh, you take your body in space and 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 make the music come alive. Uh, so so there is um, the body also makes the arms move. For instance, I think that is uh, an important one, or the touch that you touch like humans, not like ballet dancers. There is a difference of just simple little gestures and those make it important to make it humane, actually, in quality. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to put ballet down. <laughs> it's beautiful in a different way, you know? It, it's, it, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's hard to really explain these, these uh, very intricate differences. Did, did, does he explain it to you? Well, when you were a young dancer, did Kilian explain it to you about how to change that that the kinetic force of the movement through the body and to make it less from the classical, using the classical? Uh, I, I think uh, his way of choreographing on dancers, he would give a lot of uh, imagery. So he would give you an image and then from that image you would move and then he would correct it and add things and subtract things. Uh, and definitely the music was always in every piece that he makes. The music is like the guideline, like listen to the ting or listen to the woom or the, the deep note there. So your body has to move like that music. So you become like the instruments that you hear. So if you start to become very uh, defined in what you're hearing, you give textures to your dancing as well. So this classical base that you have gives you the strength to be able to move and sway in textures. 
Celine, let's bring you in here because you are actually doing this in the studio. I mean, you're famed in Britain as a classical ballerina, and I imagine that when you're interpreting specific characters, as you do in classical performance of Cinderella or something, or the Swan Queen, it's it's different from embodying, let's say, emotions and musicality. How how have you come around to to learning that? Is it a fresh feeling for you? It is. Um... In many ways, it's similar to learning classical in, in the way that you're learning who you are on stage, who you're going to be. Um, and like Cora said, sh um, she's taught us how to understand the music a lot more than I think. I feel like when we're doing a classical ballet, we're really relying on the counts and it's the, you know, we're, we're really you know, strict with that. But there are counts, obviously, for Forgotten Land. But I think Cora has been pushing us to listen, really listen to the music and the the sort of um, key notes, introduction notes that that help us to move along. Um, and I think that's been a really interesting and an eye opening um, event for all of us. To, and I actually think that that gives us a little bit more insight into the ballet and and how we can. Um, feel connected to the music and how the music drives the movement. Like Cora said, like the movement, you know, it comes from the breath, but it also comes from the music. What is the music telling us to do? Did you all take the music home and, and, and learn it from the record before you came into the studio? No. <laughs> no, no. Learning the music as you learn the steps. <clears throat> Yeah, we did. Um, and what's been great, Cora has been very specific um, in telling us how to listen, what to listen for. You know, it can be the, the slightest bum, and that's the note that you're, you know, listening out for. And I have to take my my position on that. Um, yeah, no, it's just been all in the studio, all with Cora, just pouring her heart out to us. It's just been really, really great. And she's just been giving, 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 which is wonderful. And that's what you need in, in the teacher is them to just give without holding anything back. And she's performed it. It's just it's just really, really amazing. Um, and I was actually going to say that Petit Mora was the first Killian that I'd ever seen. Um, which was actually created on Cora. Um, so to be actually doing a Killian, it's just, um, it's, it's really, really wonderful. I know that um, many ballerinas that I've met, like Sylvie Guillem, Tamara Rocco, Leanne Benjamin, all told me that they wished that they had been able to dance Killian more in their careers. But Carlos, one thing that you do see less of in Killian um, is the big technical virtuosity um, that classical ballet and you yourself are renowned for. Um, how, how do you kind of convey a different kind of excitement to substitute for all that virtuosity? What Killian gives you is an opportunity to, of growth as an artist and as a dancer to expand your vocabulary. To me, I always was drawn uh, to this art form, the fact that I could keep growing constantly. And I think a classical for all these shapes and form, uh, you hit a point in, in, in the repertory that you hit the roof. You, you done it and you repeating yourself, but uh, different idioms and different forms, they give you opportunity to expand your artistic growth. And Killian is a never ending. He's highly, highly conceptual. He is uh, very deep. He is the king of musicality. So, uh, you know, even conceptual pieces and, and rhythmic pieces like Falling Angels, which again, he keeps surprising uh, you constantly in terms of the possibilities that, that he could put on stage. And, uh, you know, for, for an artist, that's, that's, uh, that's the best you could get, you know, the possibility of coming to a studio and then learn something new. And that's what I'm saying that it's been a big regret in my career. It's almost like my career is incomplete from that point of view, because I haven't got the chance to have a Killian in my career, but luckily, the dancers at BRB, you know, in their resume and their bio, they could just say, I did a Killian, and this is something that I could never say. Cora, I know that Killian himself felt he was um, ignored by Britain to some extent, and many, uh, you know, many people have said he was a lack and a gap in Britain. 
Um, a few years ago, he famously accused British critics of spoiling his chances. So is the BRB bill really almost a, a, an important symbolic um, emotional event for him? I think it's wonderful that he's stepping into England back to giving pieces. Uh, I think he was very upset uh, and emotionally hurt by Clement Crisp, who is no longer with us, but uh, he uh, had a hard time with the critics of uh, Clement. And he saw also that his colleagues like William Forsythe, Mats Eck had an equivalent experience and so uh, I think a lot of these choreographers, when they talked about coming to Settlers Wells or England, they they kind of didn't enjoy it so much because they were slashed. <laughs> uh, so it was a hard step for them to swallow. You know, at one point they were like, oh, we don't care about the critics. But then when they got so slashed, they were like, oh, this is hurting my ego. <laughs> I don't know. It was painful for them. Uh, and I think Yuri wrote a very long letter to Clement explaining his uh, frustration and 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 uh, yeah how how it's it, it affected him uh, that words can actually because you're very fragile as a choreographer even how great you are you're you know you're fragile and to have strong words uh, spoken then pieces like falling angels were called a great Jane Fonda workout or. Yeah, things like that was just not called for, you know, it was a uh, Well, that, that, it could be said, A, that that's uh, one voice who uh, perhaps was you took too, notice, too much notice of. But I the think other, he took a lot of notice of this one voice. <laughs> I, I don't think companies, to be honest, um, to my regret, uh, take as yeah, very much notice of critics. <laughs> but uh, in a sense then, but but I mean, Birmingham Royal Ballet doing this, is this the start of a new relationship, do you think, um, of, of Killian? I with hope so, people? I hope so. It's, it's uh, let, let's see if, if they are willing to continue with this. But my, my experience here now has been really wonderful with the dancers and I will portray that back to him. So, uh, yeah. I, I think it's interesting that there was really, or I could explain it, there was really a boom in strong choreography simultaneously in Britain and in Germany, or perhaps a German one came slightly later, because of course, um, Cranko and Macmillan both went to Germany to um, flex their muscles in a sense and spread their wings because they felt um, there wasn't enough room in the well-stock Royal Ballet, for instance. So Tudor, I think, did the same. Um, and Cranko launched this new boom over there. So. I think Killian was made a couple of offers by the Royal Ballet, but they weren't on very uh, helpful kind of working condition terms. One was from Nureyev, I think, that he thought that might be a bit unbalanced. Um, and another from the Royal Ballet, the touring company. Um, but, um, you know, you've got Cranko, Killian, Neumeyer, Forsyth, Tetley and so on, just when um, Ashton Macmillan are inspiring Bintley and Jonathan Burroughs, Michael Clark, you know, and then in the contemporary scene, you've got Bob Cohan and Richard Alston, Christopher Bruce and so on. You might say there's a sort of excess of riches. So, Carlos, um, this actually comes around to you, really. I mean, you know from the BRB's rep what a bounty you've got to choose from and commissioning is tricky, isn't it? Deciding what to acquire. Yes, obviously, yeah, there's a lot of choices there. But I mean, I mean, Achillean for me, I I felt that like Cora was stating, um, I, we don't see enough of Killian in these shores. Uh, and uh, he's got so much wonderful pieces that the UK audiences and the companies alike are, are um, I just bypassing them somehow. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a must. Obviously, I'm a fan of Christopher Bruce. I, I work with him a lot uh, in Rooster. He's uh, uh, Guru Garden, which is a masterpiece that, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we can revive it at some point. I think the pieces like that, um, they still have a place uh, today. And uh, but I just I just wanted to bring new choreographer, new experiences to the like you say the vast repertory that the company have, uh, while at the same time pieces that are very physical and that can develop the dancers across the board, not just the principal dancer but everyone. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, this is just the beginning for the relationship that uh, I would like to. To, for BRB to form with, with the Killian rep. 
but there will be other choreographers coming because uh, I think in the diversity of choices and vocabularies, that's how you build the dancers. Um, and uh, since the beginning, I've been throwing so much at them. You know, it's a, it's a big shock, uh, uh, but uh, I think it's a beautiful one because I think it shows, you know, the development of the company. And I think uh, I think we're on, on that on that um, is the route that I'm going to follow. S Celine, I wanted to ask you a bit more about this this question of developing your career because it this is you've been um, a, a ballerina now in the classical world for quite a, for quite a long time now. Is is Killian something that enables you to feel that you can um, extend your career in a sense because you're not having to do all the you know the pirouettes and the and, and the you know the more virtuosic stuff is this something that you can act well after all um Killian has I'm not saying you need to do that what I'm saying is that Killian has developed a style that he was able for instance to have a third company of NDT for he's able to extend the career from very young to really as as long as you like I mean is it quite body friendly I suppose is what I'm asking I was actually gonna say that because we are so classically trained um you know point work all that we found it difficult to um switch to a more um I guess turned in it's in a, a ballet soft ballet shoes um you know we opened our season with Capelia last week and coming into this week with rehearsals for Forgotten Land, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, my thighs were really sore because it's just a different way of using the muscles. So I don't actually think it's easier. It's not easier. I think actually it is a bit harder, you know. Um, you have to feel that sort of, it's a different feeling. It's not, you know, as in classical ballet, it's more light up feeling you know in the to pull up through the point shoe and then now we have we still feel up but there's a more sort of grounded feeling um the lifts are you know tricky but exciting i don't think that it is easier we do pirouettes as well we do do pirouettes <laughs> so I, you know i didn't mean to say that it's easier what i meant that because um let's say it's because you're adding a new string to your bow and because you're not having to do, I mean, multiple fuetes and all that sort of thing, which is really very hard on the body and prone makes you prone to injuries and so on. This mm -hmm. is a more holistic way of movement is. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could look at it, look at it that way. Um, I think for myself, I look at myself as being a versatile dancer. I've, you know, I've done contemporary work with BRB before. And so, moving into Killian's work has been, it's been easy because of the previous that we've done. Um, so yeah, in a way, I, I can understand what you're trying to say that it does extend, you know, your options um, and your pathways. And yes, it would, if you're interested. Well, what's the partnering feeling that's different now? Because in ballet, um, classical ballet, the presentation of the woman by the man has quite sort of a specific sort of um, sexual presentation in a sense. Um, you know, you're the beautiful object and you're doing all this very beautiful stuff, but actually the man is presenting you. But is there, do you have a, a sense of it more um, democratic, more equal kind of partnering that goes on in Kilian? Yes, there is. There is the reverse. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, you're jumping. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. It is, yeah, it's getting a bit choppy. Um, there is the reverse first of partnering so I partner my partner Tyrone um, and then also I partner a girl um, in a trio bit uh, so yeah there is the reverse so we get that sort of different feeling we get the understanding of what it is like to partner someone which is you know it's not difficult to keep someone on their on their leg and support them can I just add to that a little bit I think with the uh, Killian uh, uh, with the Forgotten Land, let's just uh, that's it, it's it's like a partnership is a lot more off balance. Like you're pulling away from each other and you're pulling towards each other. You have to give the weight. It's it's a different thing than partnering when somebody's doing a pirouette or putting them on their leg as, as an arabesque. You no, know? of course you do also all the tricks and everything like this. You need each other totally. But there is a lot of push and pull. Push and pull is a good thing to explain. Yeah. 
between each other. You need trust. And once you slip, that's <laughs> you gotta have a good grip to be able to do and feel the freedom. Yeah. Carlos, um, what are the connections that you wanted to make between this and the Uwe Schultz work and the new hotel work in this bill? Uh, I just want to give the, you know, the, the sense of what BRB is capable of doing, representing all these styles while still represented a, a, a ballet like Killian and Seven Symphony, which is traditional classical uh, vocabulary, uh, the Seven Symphony, but at the same time bringing uh, a new work that it feels more now. It's hotel is highly tech, contemporary music, brilliantly composed by uh, Mika Carson, and also Morgan, which again uh, is a young choreographer that uh, uh, at the moment is making her mark as well and just um you know to have a nice package for the evening uh, and so that uh we have three distinctive journeys so that's 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 the idea uh, so that it doesn't flee, uh, uh, feel unidimensional uh and and also at the same time showing off the new talents coming uh through through, through the company I think the Schultz would be really interesting. I mean, he which we'd never seen before. He was a actually yeah. a music student to start with before he started dancing, and he was also a music professor, I think, as well as being Leipzig Ballet's artistic director and choreographer. So clearly, music he was will be yeah. almost like seeing a musician's choreographic interpretation of the Beethoven. Yeah. And you see it throughout the choreography. It's in, it's like a, 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 a symphonic of movement. And obviously the, the orchestra, they're very, very excited to manage to play the Seventh Symphony, which uh, for the first time we haven't, they haven't been able to. And so there, as you see, it's very, it features, the program features the music as well, uh, hence why it's called into the music, you know, having Britain and having also Seventh Symphony and Mika Carson. So I think from that point of view, the musical, musical point of view is very rich as well. Cora, how do you rehearse um, when you're doing such major pieces of music, when the choreographer has responded specifically, um, spontaneously to a major piece of music, um, when you're teaching that in the studio, I mean, do you use sort of quite stock rehearse uh, recordings in order to teach it um, and then introduce them all to the live um, experience at the last minute? Or Because I mean, obviously you can't rehearse with the orchestra, can you, until the very end? No, exactly. The, the conductor has been in in the very beginning of my block when I came in. And then today he returned to listen and they've been practicing separate. So I've been working with two different recordings of orchestra works that we go by for Tempe. So uh, one video uh, recollection and one really recording that's kind of the base Tempe that Yuri actually created on. And of course, that's the one that we keep referring to. And today I spoke of like three moments in that recording that were a touch on the first side so that he can take that in account. So, but we get together really like for three rehearsals before the show that we have the orchestra. So, but I think the dancers are used to it working with live music more. So I, I think uh, it shouldn't be a problem. I think they know their music now. I think I've, I've told them every ping and pong they've got to listen to. So, <laughs> so I think they've got it. <laughs> Let's just sum up with what we'll actually see in each of these three ballets. The, the, the Killian, are we, will we see a woman at the three different stages of her life in a white dress and a red dress and a black dress? Is that yeah. what we will actually see? We will, yeah. There are uh, six couples and they're all different co co colors. So we have the red, the pink. So they're also the, and then you have the black and the gray, and then you have the white and the beige. So we have uh, all these colors representing the different stages of life. So the, the white couple is for the, the youthful love. Then the black couple is the dark mature couple and the red is like in the midst of their life and excitement and flirtatiousness and uh, challenge. 
And then the pink is the little flirt, the gray is a little bit the struggling couple that sort of keep pushing on. So it represents all these different kinds of stages of relationships in life. Uh, and the Schultz, do we see a, a similar sort of semi-narrative in there? I don't think so. I think it's straight. Uh, I mean, at some point you have images that you just try for, but it's, it's just a symphony of movement. There are waves and cannons, and it's almost a, a portrait of the music uh, through the movement. But, uh, you know, it just work, uh, and it's a great finisher as well, because it's a large cast, it's very physical. Everybody dances, doing really technical uh, steps. And uh, and yeah, and the Seventh Symphony, it's, uh, it leaves you on a cliffhanger kind of stuff. So you finish, you hit those last poles and then black out, and, you know, it, it's that, that kind of um, finisher. So, but it, it's basically, it's just a, a, a symphony of movement, I would say. And the Royal Ballet Symphonia, which I, I've always thought was the best ballet orchestra in England or Britain, probably. I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble with Scotland there, but but uh, they will be loving this programme with so much music to play. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. They I mean, they yeah, for, for the minute that I communicated, I was I was going to bring uh, the Seventh Symphony and Forgotten Land, you know, and all these people, they, they just, you know, they're really, really exciting about it. Yeah. yeah. The conductor is super excited about uh, the Britain, playing the Britain. He's like, oh, it's such a good work. It's such a good place. <laughs> it's Jonathan, a challenge also for them. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Jonathan, I think we've got lots of questions. We we have had um, several really good ones. I've been writing them down so I don't have to scroll through the chat box. Um, I think there's some for uh, Carlos particularly. Um, Ross would like to know whether Birmingham Royal Ballet will get to perform Sinfonietta. Oh, I love that work. Oh my God. That, I, in fact, that was my introduction to, um, to Achillean um, while I was in Houston. But I mean, for the time, uh, uh, and actually that was the, the ballet that I wanted to bring. Uh, Cora will remember that. Uh, but uh, I think maybe in the future, uh, at the moment, uh, you know, we, we, we're we not planning in the next uh, three, four years, but yeah, definitely for the future, you know, it's, some, it's, it's another one to look, look out for. Yeah. And Terry has a similar question. Um, any plans to bring back Hans van Manen's Grossa Fuga? Oh, this is a great work. Yeah, not at the moment. I've Sorry. done it. <laughs> no, yeah, you've done it now. Yeah, no, definitely. Van Manen is another example of a yeah. great European choreographer who hasn't really been able to be exposed very much in Britain just because there's so much going on in Britain. And I suppose that there, I, I've always regretted that you know we haven't been able to see more um, European work. There are certainly taste differences because the taste in Britain of the British audience has been shaped by you know the British work, which does have different musical interests and different dramatic and psychological um uh, sort of settings and histories and traditions and so on um and sense of humor or whatever but um van manen i think is is like Killian. you know you you simply see that there's been so much going on in uh, in britain that maybe you can say that that's why they haven't been able to make slots for them um, I mean, big music also is a big challenge for the for the audience. We do have uh, uh, in our repertory here, Birmingham. Is it Jonathan? Five tangos. We do have. We have five tangos and Gossa Fuga. Yeah. We've done both. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, the, uh, and we we have performed here quite a lot. Uh, you know, be, before my time, there was a regular some of the regular pieces that uh, they would do. They, they, David will bring over and over. I mean, I, I'm trying to also expand the repertory and in, into creations. Uh, and so that's why I had to have rooms while, while keeping the traditional uh, uh, classical ballets that uh, is a must have. But, uh, you know, at the moment it, it's just, you know, uh, I like to also expand by creating new ones. And actually there's a similar uh, sort of follow-up question to that, um, Carlos, and maybe this is for Cora too about, um, from Terry again, are there any um, new young Dutch choreographers that you'd like to um, ask to make pieces for the company? In fact, there is, uh, um, Wubke, Wubke 
Uh, yeah, I am very fond of her work. She's again young, uh, and I'd like to invite her uh, possibly in a couple of years to do something with us. And we are in conversation, uh, or, you know, to participate in these productions that I'd like to bring uh, and create for the company. And so, yeah, that's uh, we are in conversation at the moment, and I think it, it will happen in a couple of years. Mm. Cool. Are there any other choreographers, you know, in, in Holland or elsewhere on Europe that um, should be? I mean, I like Crystal Pite. I like her work a lot. Um, yeah, it's a, I see a lot of dads and then sometimes maybe I'm uh, old school, but I want to be touched with what I see. Like I don't just uh sometimes these modern choreographers they just move 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 floor 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 and then nothing gets said by the end and then I'm like oh I don't know about this <laughs> I sort of want still to get something out of performance that you watch uh, and so yeah the last piece that I saw that really touched me was Crystal Pipes um, yeah. which is being done in full you know, well flight pattern is about to be I shown in London at the uh, Rob Lane full a new full full length range version. And there is a new creation, I think, next Tuesday, I think is the opening night for well, the it, no, that's that's the revised version of, of flight pattern, which is now been pattern. expanded to full length. So that would be interesting to see how a, a compressed short work expands. <laughs> that's a well, Winter Dreams, it happened with the same with Winter Dreams. Uh, it was first a part of day into the then uh, you know, can it be you know uh, upgraded into a fool uh, so yeah we'll see i mean I, i'm a i'm a really great admirer of, of crystal obviously everyone me and everybody else i suppose <laughs> uh, and I, i've been in conversation to get a uh, polaris which is a great piece uh it's great to you could insert the students and it's almost inedit because it always been performed, as far as I know, only once in Southern Wales. They only had one run. Obviously, it's a large score. And i had been set out to try to get into the company. But yeah, I, yeah, it, it's a bit difficult. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, again. It, it is a difficult balance, isn't it? Because when what we're talking about here is a, a large globe of of top level choreography and if you are also trying to give uh rising choreographers the chance to try right. and to be given the chance to fail and not be condemned for right. it they've got to sit up i mean you know morgan's going to be sitting there between you know killian and schultz two massive works right. um you know good luck to the to the confidence you need as a young as a young choreographer to do that but those spaces must be found because the audience itself must never get complacent and just think, oh, we'll just pluck the big ones off the tree from the world. Exactly. And I, and I think I, I do know the pressure that she must be feel, you know, uh, but I think, you know, she should just be confident because I think she's doing a brilliant job. She's bringing something completely different that it feels 21st century now. And again, there they shouldn't be a, a sense of comparison uh, like that, like, but rather, a, you know, just a mirror to put in, in front of you uh, and, and just react to it. And I think, you know, she's just great. She's doing a massive, a brilliant job. The dancers like her work. The process has been great. Uh, and uh, I think at the end, it's, it's great. It's great what she's come, coming up with. I've got an, another question that came in a while ago. I think it's, it's a really good one. Um, I'll have to sort of paraphrase it, but it is about do teachers who teach company class in the morning adjust their classes depending on the choreographer that they're working with or the pieces they're working on later in the day? Um, I don't know, maybe Celine could answer that one. I've got my own thoughts too, but... <laughs> um, well... No, I don't think so. <laughs> I had class with um, Johnny. <laughs> well, actually, well, I'll, I'll give a stab to answering that one if, if, you, if you don't mind. Then, I mean, <laughs> it's difficult because in when we're rehearsing like this, this um, into the music, they're, they're doing a range of different styles. So you've got to teach a class that sort of covers all bases and get people ready for the day. I teach the company twice a week, and 
I am aware of the obviously of the you know, Achilles. So, for example, Celine would have done this just this morning. The very first warm up at the bar, I start. I can't believe I'm sort of demonstrating on Zoom. It's a bit bizarre, but you know, <laughs> things through the body and circling the shoulder and circling the head, and then when we get into the centre not today but last week putting a lot of this one verse movement that comes into it because that that is reflected in the choreography just to sort of get the cast back into that sort of way of thinking when we were doing don quixote last season carlos said to me oh jonathan please can you make them do double assemblies on turno which i was happy to put into class so i think it's tricky i think we have to do a class that covers everything for 60 dancers but if you can try and bring in elements of the style or the choreography then that's that's a good thing. I don't know whether Cor has got anything to add to that or... I think that something that stood out today in morning class was that you gave Fuetes, um, which is great because we still have to keep ourselves in tune for Capelia shows, which we're doing, you know, after this triple bill. So we still, you know, still have to keep conditioned in that very classical way as well. Well, that's fine with class because you've got 30, say 30 ladies in class this morning. All, all with different days, all doing different parts in different ballets, different ages. So it's it's a it's a challenge, but exciting one to try and get that um, that that kind of class correct. Um, Carlos, I've got one specifically to you that's coming from Logan. Um, did you get teased at school for doing ballet? Of course, <laughs> I mean, and that is what make make me run away from it even more. Uh, there was still that stigma, and I suppose there's still that stigma today. Uh, that you know, it's something that women do, or that men has no place in. And uh, but a, again, you can imagine in the '80s in Cuba, in where I used to live, how embarrassing it was to be a ballet dancer. Uh, all of a sudden, I became the the neighbor's clown. But uh, you know, I think it was obviously my story has been very well documented and highly documented. And obviously, my father never gave up. And then three years later, I was hooked and developed this passion. And uh, and then uh, it became my mission uh, in life. But in the beginning, like any beginnings, it, it, they're very rough. Um, and so I, I had I had not uh, an exception. One thing I wanted to ask, going back to the question of the music, I mean, this is a bill about music, dance and music, is how tastes of dancers change. Uh, you could have relied, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago that a lot of younger dancers would know quite a lot of classical music. Today, I think that's not so easy to say, and they are much more used to listening to electronic music or listening to contemporary music of various kinds that really are, have moved on quite a bit from um, big 19th century scores. And I wonder how you sort of, how do you bring them to that classical music and make them feel that it's fresh and personal to them, as fresh and personal um, as perhaps the music that they're listening to all the time? Perhaps Cora can answer that. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say. Oh, can I say that, that <laughs> we wouldn't be doing this job if we didn't love that kind of music so that's something that a lot of us who have st had started dancing we started dancing to classical music or you know and that's something that draws us to this art form so that's just yeah. that's a lovely thing to hear <laughs> no, I, think that, I mean and dance is music you need to and i think dancers even love going to go out and dance to disco music whatever but they need to express themselves and music is the key to it all yeah uh, we we just have about four minutes left it's the one question just come in which i would like to squeeze in we partly covered it but it's a really good question um and it's from Leanne uh, McPherson. I'll just read it straight from the chat box. Other than learning the choreography, I'm interested to know what other exercises, supplementary tasks the dancers do to really understand and convey the story of the choreography, style, mood, music, and characters, etc. It's a bigger but a great question. Who'd like to take that one on? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's something that I've always done for years now being in the company, um, you do your own research, you go online. Um, it's wonderful that we have that portal, you know, <laughs> dancers 
from previously probably didn't have YouTube and all these things, you know, to see other dancers, what they can do and how they did it. I think the most important thing for me for um, Forgotten Land is getting the style right. I want to look like, you know, I was the first person to do Killian with, with Forgotten Land. And I just want to know, and which Cora has been helping us to get it to look authentic. You know, that's that's the most important thing. So yeah, we do we do our research and to understand exactly what we have to portray. It's a triple bill as well. So each each ballet is completely different. And, and we're lucky that we have great repetitors such as Cora, such as Rosa, who's doing Seven Symphony, that just pours into us all the information all the background all the feelings you know for us of course then we as artists can have some space to interpret that but we I mean I'm sure Celine you agree I mean we are given so much support and help and advice and ideas to help us get into any particular bag that we're rehearsing yeah and I think I've seen a huge transformation like with Celine as well like from when I first stepped into the rehearsal and then where it is now it's done a huge arc to where she's now living the movement more fully and yeah it's a wonderful uh, process to see how much people take to their role and how much they transport themselves and create what they want to create with their bodies and be themselves you know like Celine is Celine doing the work and it's beautiful to watch Brilliant, brilliant questions. I'm, I'm going to throw one really quick one, and maybe everyone can answer this with just a few words. Um, and it's it's Isla has asked, what would you say was the key learning point for your career? Or the, so the main thing you've learned about your career. Let's let's throw Cora into the deep end on that one. Oh my god! <laughs> or anyone else who wants to jump in? Uh... Oh my God, yeah, that's a hard one. That you don't always have to, um, maybe it was Ohad Naharin, that uh, when I also was kind of classically trained and I was like doing a piece of his and I was like holding my breath and holding my chest and walking into the corner. And then he was like, no, Cora, just walk like you would walk on the street, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it broke me. I remember I ended up in that rehearsal in tears. But then the next day I came in and I walked like myself to that corner. And then he said, now you understand. <laughs> and it was like a really like switch of just you have to not be yourself. You can actually just be yourself, be a person on stage. And I think that was a huge change for me to understand, like I can just stand and be. Yeah. It's worth remembering that Balanchine was inspired by watching people in New York walking on the street. And that was one of the influences yeah. on his specific development of style in America. So Carlos. Carlos. <laughs> no, for me, I always had this thing early on, which is basically never give up, always keep curious, always keep uh, trying. To me, that's a driving force of everything. It's just always, always uh, keep keep working to go to the next level. Uh, and then obviously, uh, I always wanted to have my own imprint in whatever I do. And for that, it, it's uh, you rely on everybody's help from the coaches, from people around you. And now you got YouTube, of course, but ultimately you need to know where you are in the context of all this information and then bring something that people can remind you, uh, remember you by, and, and something that perhaps that's a, that sort of sense that you're bringing something to the table that is distinctive, uh, plant that as an idea for others. So to me, it was always that commitment to try to bring something. And I, it wasn't always, uh, I, I I didn't succeed all the time, obviously, and uh, and sometimes I fail at trying to to bring something new. Um, but I think that that idea also, also is is very important to me, so that uh, uh, I have my own essence in whatever I do. And the last last one to uh, Celine, what have you learned so far? Yeah, 
Um, for myself, this is something that my mom actually has taught me and because she she taught me, she's a ballet teacher, she taught me how to dance. Um, that's why I'm a ballet dancer um, now. And she said to always trust your technique. Um, that is something that you've worked so hard to achieve. And especially when you get on stage, you know, the lights, the costume, everything, the audience is there. You know, so many of these things can, you know, take over you and take over your composure and, and that calmness. And then once you trust your technique, everything else will happen there and mold together to be organic. It is just gone seven o'clock and, I, and I, I could keep listening to this for ages. It's been fascinating. I'm looking at my other panelists, whether it should be time for me to sadly wrap up and say thank you. But if you do cast your eye onto the chat box, we are getting so many messages thanking us for this evening and telling us they're looking forward to seeing the performances in Birmingham and at Sadler's Wells. So if you haven't got your tickets, buy them now. If you've got your tickets, tell your friends too. We're at the Hippodrome and at Sadler's Wells Theatre and all sorts of offers for students available. Keep a lookout on our social media um, to find out more. Um, I'd like to say um, a huge thank you, firstly, to Ismini Brown for stepping in quite late notice for chairing a fascinating discussion. So thank you so much. It's been fun, hasn't it? Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. And I'd like to thank, again, all our panellists, Carlos, Celine and Cora for giving so much time and generosity of experiences and thoughts this evening. I'm sure everyone has really appreciated it. Um, and thank you for joining. I hope we can do one of these again soon. I feel sad to be leaving, but I guess we have to say goodbye as the hearts float up my screen, I can see. <laughs> thank, so, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.